In this next video, I want to define a couple new things and uh, move on to more of Newton's laws of motion. Uh, so, so we can kind of, you know, we're not going to think about numbers or, or, or use any equations yet, but I want you to imagine that we have an object, maybe this eraser, and, uh, <laughs> and I exert a force on it, right? So I push on it this hard and maybe I, you know, I give it a little bit of velocity so it scoots along there. Um, and you can kind of, I mean, even though you're not here, you can kind of imagine how hard I'm pushing on this. The answer is not very hard. Now, let's imagine that if instead of this eraser, I had a lead brick, which I will represent with a eraser turn on, turn on its side. So now, I, if I exert the same force on this lead brick, uh, uh, you know, I can push on it uh, the same amount or even harder and get it to move very little. Right, there is something different about that object that makes it harder to change the motion of. So this idea is called inertia. And our, our first definition of inertia is gonna be uh, how much an object resists change in its motion. So in other words, an object with a lot of inertia strongly resists changes in its motion, which means if it stop, it's really hard to get moving, or if it's moving, it's really hard to stop. Um, something with low inertia or small inertia it is easier to change its motion. So for example, uh, a car, you know, a car has a lot of inertia. If I put, you know, if I have it in neutral and it is rolling freely, I have to push on it, you know, pretty hard for a long time to get it to change its motion so that it has some velocity. And conversely, if you're standing in front of a car that's rolling towards you, uh, it's hard and very dangerous to try to stop it by pushing on the front uh, because of its inertia. If this was, you know, if this was a um, bicycle, it would be slightly easier. And if it was a giant block of styrofoam or something, it would be even easier, right? So the difference between these things is inertia and, uh, how do we quantify the inertia? Right, what variable can we, can we mash up with this inertia? This is, of course, mass. So the term mass, as we use it um, most of the time, uh, really mass is, is, is short for inertial mass in this case. Um, physicists talk about different kinds of mass even though it turns out that they they are the same thing, or maybe the same thing has different properties that we assign to it, and so we have different names for those properties. So anyway, one thing that mass does is give an object inertial mass. So uh, this is you know this is the m mass that we've used other places. So our units for this are kilograms in the SI system, uh, not grams, so be aware of that. Um, yeah, we like kilograms. If you want to know more about kilograms versus grams, uh, I will talk for a long time about kilograms. So, all right. So now that we have mass, we're actually ready to define something else important, and that is force, or our force variable, I should say. So our variable for force is capital F. Um, we'll talk about the units in just a second, but I will, I will tell you uh, the units are Newtons, named after Isaac Newton, uh, and that's uh, capital N. Uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll get to the derivation of the Newton in just a second um, and, and how big it is. Okay, so one important thing about force is that it is also a vector, just like velocity and acceleration. So our force has a direction and a magnitude. So the magnitude will be some number of newtons, right? The force is 100 newtons big, and the direction is in the plus x direction, or, you know, at a 30 degree angle to the plus y direction or something like that. Um, 
And that also means we can express this in terms of its vector components. So we can talk about the x component of a force or the y component of a force as we as we did with velocity. Lastly, I should also say, you know, if we're being careful in talking about this force vector, um, it is best to draw our little arrow over the top to indicate that this is a vector the same way I said we could do with velocity and acceleration, but then we never really had to do in our equation. So I will probably write this on the board, and so that's what I mean. I'm talking about the vector force. Okay, great. Now we're ready for Newton's second law, and, um, and with that we'll get to Newton's also. All right, Newton's second law. Um, <laughs> it, what Newton's second law does is it quantifies this relationship that we talked about in the first law about how forces can change the motion of an object. Um, there are versions of Newton's second law that are in words, but I think the best one is just a very short equation, and that is, uh, that is the following. So this says, uh, F net equals MA, and this is a force vector, and this is an acceleration vector. So the net force here, this is, we can think of this as the sum of all of the forces on an object. So we can write this, we can write this with our summation symbol, uh, like from math, and a force vector. So sometimes I write it like this, it, uh, you know, the sum of all of our forces, sigma f, is equal to ma. So this is probably the way I write it, the way I write it the most. But some books and sometimes I, if it's convenient, use uh, f net to mean the net force. So if you add all the forces together, you're left with one vector, and that is this net force vector. So this just this just tells you that adding part this assumes that you know that all the forces added together gives you this net force. Okay, so uh, so what's going on in this equation? Uh, well, this already tells us things that we that we know, and that is that if, if we don't have a net force on the object, if the net force is zero, then the acceleration is zero also, right? If zero equals ma, and our object has some mass, a must be zero, right? So, so this tells us you know, F equals zero tells us Newton's first law, right? This is the first law. So this meant A equals zero, and that was that was what we had that went along with the with the first law. Okay, uh, so if we do have a force on an object, if we are pushing an object a certain amount, the acceleration we get from that depends on the mass, right? And in particular, the acceleration we get if we just divide both sides by m it's equal to F over M. So for a particular amount of force on an object, if the object has a big mass with a big number in the denominator, we get a small acceleration. If it has a small mass in the denominator, we get a big acceleration. So this is our, you know, pushing on the heavy block versus pushing on the light block business. This is um, consistent with that picture, which is good, right? Objects with big inertial mass are hard to move. They're hard to accelerate. Objects with small inertial mass are easy to move and accelerate. All right, we'll just give ourselves some more room here. So our units, let's talk about Newtons just for a second. So remember, if we keep everything in SI units on one side of the equation, we will always get our answer in SI units on the other side of the equation. So if I plug in mass and acceleration in SI units, I get kilograms times acceleration is meters per second squared. And so this is equal to the newton. So one newton is one kilogram times one meter per second squared, or in other words, one newton is what it takes to accelerate one kilogram of whatever, a one kilogram object at a rate of one meter per second squared. So it turns out in terms of forces that we are familiar with, one newton is a pretty, reasonable sized force. It is the 
it is the weight, we'll talk about weight in a little bit, uh, the weight of a roughly like a quarter pound. So imagine a um, hamburger or meat substitute, you know, patty in your hand. And that's about, that's about, that's exerting about one Newton of force on you. Um, now is a great time to say, because I didn't talk about this earlier, weight is distinct from mass. So we use mass and weight in every day kind of interchangeably, and I certainly do in my day-to-day -day life. Um, but in Physics 106, they are different ideas, and we will be very careful to use one and not the other. Um, and I will be sloppy about this, and I will say, so we have a block that weighs one kilogram, but you all really know that I mean mass, and I will try my best <laughs> to not do that. Um, yeah, so weight and mass are different, and we will learn about weight in, in chapter four. Okay, I think that's everything I have to say about the second law. No, not true. More things to say about the second law. The second law is super important. It is the equation we use the most in chapters three, and four. So it's good to know. Um, so this, I'm going to use the other version of it just because I, I tend to use it more. So we have this equation, the sum of the forces equals m times the acceleration. So because these are vectors, right, uh, f and a have to be in the same direction. That's just a uh, property of vector equations. If one side is a vector, the other side is the same vector, and so, <laughs> so they have to be pointing in the same direction if they're the same thing. Uh, because these are vectors, we also can split them up into their components. So it turns out this equation really gives us two equations. This gives us Newton's second law in the x direction, so the sum of all of the x components of our forces is equal to m times the x component of our acceleration, and the same thing in the y direction. The sum of the y components of all of our forces are equal to m times the y components of our acceleration. So this equation is really two equations in one, and it is very often that we will be, you know, the first thing we will do is write down each of these separately and, and use them. So that's another good thing to uh, to, to keep in mind. All right. Great. Uh, so lastly, for today, we'll talk about Newton's third law. And uh, Newton's third law is, is the following. So the, the pithy short version that you here in action movies, I don't know, is every action has an equal and opposite reaction or something like that. Um, that is kind of close to Newton's original language. When he said action, that was kind of the old timey way of saying force. Uh, or we can, we'll, we'll pretend that's true for the moment. So, so instead of saying every action has an equal and opposite reaction, Really what he's saying for Physics 106 purposes is every force has an equal and opposite other force. And we'll, we'll you'll see what I mean because we're going to rephrase this in other words. Okay, so here's my phrasing of Newton's third law. It is kind of long. If object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts a force on object A that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So in other words, we have two objects. If one of them exerts a force on the other one, that second one has to be exerting a force on the first one that is exactly as big and right, right back at it. Um, so, you know, the picture for this, you know, here's, here is object A. Here is object B, and if these two, you know, come together and touch or something, we'll leave a gap just for the sake of making it. Uh, so if, if object B is exerting a force on object A, maybe there's a magnet or something, right? Or maybe there's a string tie between them, it really doesn't matter. So if this is the force of B on A, so B is pushing on object A that way, 
Newton's third law tells us there must be a force on object B from object A that is in the opposite direction, so down to the right, and is the same magnitude, the same number of newtons. So this is the force of A on B. If we wanted to write this in, in terms of an equation, it would be a kind of silly short equation, but we'll do that. Um, so it's like this. The force of object A on object B is equal to minus the force of object B on object A. So the minus sign here is saying that these two are the same vector. The minus sign is just flipping the direction of that vector. So the minus sign is keeping everything the same except reversing the direction of that vector 180 degrees. Um, the other important thing about this, or, you know, so, so this is kind of a sentence statement, this is kind of an equation statement. The kind of rule of thumb that comes out of this is forces always come in pairs. And textbooks refer to these pairs as third law pairs because they exist because of the third law. So this is um, this this shows up everywhere. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes the other force totally doesn't matter in the problem. Sometimes it's really important and something to think about. Um, but it's always it always messes with people's heads that this is true. Um, like if I'm pushing on the wall, you know, with five newtons of force or whatever, the wall is pushing back on me with exactly that same, exactly that same amount, exactly that same five newtons of force. Um, the fact that these forces are the same magnitude is not always easy to see. Um, we'll get to some good examples that, that illustrate this later on, but the, the um, classic and slightly gruesome one that seems to show up in a lot of textbooks is like, okay, you have a big truck driving down the highway and it hits a, you know, a bug hits the windshield or something like that. And the question is, you know, which force was bigger, the force of the bug on the, wind, uh, the bug on the truck or the force of the truck on the bug? And everyone says, oh, well, the second one, the force on, of the truck on the bug was bigger because A, the truck's bigger and B, that bug got totally wasted by the, by the truck. Um, but in fact, the two forces are the same. Why we perceive them as different is because the result of that force is different. And the result of that force, we know from Newton's second law, is the acceleration. So the truck and the bug have very different masses, which causes their motions to change in very different ways from that same, from that same amount of force. So that's um, kind of the origin of this, of this difference and where this like misconception comes from. Okay, we'll have more to say about all of this later. Um, so next time we're gonna talk about kind of how to sort out the forces in a force problem, how to draw some diagrams, um, and then we'll get in, in we'll get more into um, you know, examples of actual real life forces and how to deal with those.